so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Just a heads up, this conversation contains a discussion of domestic violence and suicide. Listener discretion is advised. What little kid doesn't want their dad to take them to the shop and get them a kinder surprise? That's what Ramazan Akar told his ex-partner, Rochelle Diargent, in November 2010 when he turned up at her Melbourne home, breaking yet another intervention order that she'd taken out against him. He just wanted to take his daughter to the little shop down the road, get her a treat. Rochelle and Akar had finally separated after a five-year-long on-again, off-again relationship, and Rochelle was trying to move on with her life. She had endured years of torment at his hands, drug and alcohol fueled rages that would leave her battered and bruised, attacks that he would face court for, but never do any time. But while Rochelle had been at the receiving end of Akar's fists, their two-year-old daughter Yasmina, or Mimi as she was affectionately known, had never been the target of her father's rage. She was a happy little girl who loved to dance and ride her pink bike. And she was always so excited to see her dad. The milk bar was just a few minutes down the road. Ramazan would bring her back in no time. And after years and years of violent outbursts, Rochelle knew keeping him calm and happy in these confrontational moments was key. So she watched as her little Mimi drove off with her dad. But that quick trip would quickly turn into a six-hour ordeal with a fatal outcome. Rochelle and Mimi's story is another heartbreaking case of retaliatory filicide, a specific type of revenge murder where a parent harms their own child in order to inflict pain and suffering on their ex-partner. It's something we've been examining in depth this month, with the perpetrators we've covered in this series having shown that they want their ex to know what they're about to do, what their intentions are, and how they blame their actions on the women who they believe did them wrong. But while other men left notes or made sporadic calls, Rachel could see exactly how this was all unfolding. Because not only was Akar texting her, he was posting his intentions on Facebook. About to kill my kid, he bragged in one post. At one stage, he called Rochelle and asked if she had any last words for her little girl. Mimi came on the line and told her, Mum, I love you. A weeping Rochelle told her daughter, I love you too. It would be the last conversation she would ever have with her baby girl. Akar, angry and upset over his perception that he was being wronged by his ex and the system, who he believed were keeping him from his daughter, despite his long history of drug and alcohol abuse and violence, took the innocent little girl, just a few days shy of her third birthday, and ran. In his car was a knife with a 30 centimetre long blade. He'd already used it to self-harm, something he was known for doing. But this time, he pulled over on the side of the road and took the life of his little daughter in a way that would haunt Rochelle forever. But did he feel remorse when he was captured and put in prison? What were his concerns when he fronted court? As in so many of these cases, the concern was only about himself. I'm Claire Murphy, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. And over this month, we're examining four separate cases of retaliatory filicide. Many may not be able to understand why Rochelle let her daughter leave with her violent ex that day. But for those of us who've never been in a domestic violence relationship, we have no way of comprehending the careful balancing act that women do to make sure they keep these violent men from escalating. For many, it's a lifelong endurance with very little support. Police knew what ACAR was like. They'd taken out intervention order after intervention order, orders that he blatantly ignored. The punishment for ignoring those orders was nowhere near enough to discourage him from doing it again. He'd tried to take his own life. He'd tried suicide by cop. 
But even though he was obviously unstable and obviously violent, the system could not stop him from going to his ex and their daughter over and over again, leaving the balance of power squarely in his hands and forcing a young mother to make a decision that ended up being one she would regret for the rest of her life. Rochelle's story is one of nine case studies in Megan Norris's book, Look What You Made Me Do, Fathers Who Kill. She joins us now. So, Megan, this particular case is the one that you've named your book after. What is it about what Ramazan Karim Akar said to his partner that struck you so much that you would name your book after it? Well, because I think of all the cases, they were in a textbook, Revenge Murders, all nine, but this was absolutely crystal clear. There was no getting away from, from his intention or from the motivation that drove this crime. From the minute he abducted his little girl and took off across Melbourne on a six-hour police chase, he tormented her mother. It was just deliberate torment. He did it to pay her back for leaving him. Well, let's go back to the start of their relationship. So Akar and his partner, Rochelle D'Argent, they meet when they're teenagers. Is their relationship a struggle from the get-go? Yes. When they first met, they were both very young and he'd been not very successful academically at school, but very athletic, very sporting, troubled. His family went to live in Griffith in New South Wales, and so off they went where he got quite involved in drugs in a big way. So he progressed from cannabis to amphetamines. He was into speed. He was into ice in a very big way, all of which only fueled his anger. Rochelle and her mother went to visit him at some stage after he'd gone there. He decided he was going to come back to Melbourne to live, and he came back to live with Rochelle and her mother where things really started to deteriorate. So his drug and alcohol abuse became more prevalent. He was a heavy drug user. And with that, his moods became more volcanic and he became more unpredictable and erratic. Not long after he does move back to Melbourne, police get called and involved in their relationship. What starts to happen? Well, he's getting angry. He's on speed. He's on ice. We know that that drives violence and makes people crazy. And she said that by that stage, he was already hitting her like a man. And she was a tiny, fragile little thing. He would he would hit her like a man and throw her on the ground and spit on her. And that was escalating into, you know, from verbal abuse to worse stuff. And one of the things he did at the house was he attacked her and threatened to stab her and kill her. And when the police were called, he stabbed himself in the stomach with two steak knives. It was all very dramatic and very histrionic, but very sort of, playing the victim. I'll injure myself, look at me. So he turned the knives on himself and stabbed himself in the stomach. And he was actually charged with those offences, although it was some time before that went to court. So when he went to court, he got a, I think it was a three-month suspended sentence, suspended for two years. And whilst on that, he did other things. So there was a spell in jail for breaching his order for attacking Rochelle. And he went to jail, I think, for a little while, for about three months for drink driving offences and other offences. But he was found guilty of threats to kill, threats to cause serious harm, assaults, all those sorts of things. And it was escalating. So when he came out of prison, they resumed living together. He was still very erratic and angry. It was a cycle of beatings and attacks, apologies and promises never to do it again. But he did. And that became their relationship for a long time. So in March 2007, Rachel falls pregnant with their child. He's living with her. What's happening between them as little Yasmina or Mimi, as they end up calling her, arrives in November 2007? He's already been in prison for a stint. That seems to have changed nothing. What's the relationship like as their daughter comes into the world? Well, it's becoming very testy. It's very volatile. It's dangerous. He's still swearing and attacking her. He's drinking more heavily. He's taking drugs more often. He's losing job after job because he's on drugs, so he can't maintain the job. And everything's her fault. And so after Mimi's birth, I think in January 2009, she asked him to leave the house and said, you know, this was over. I think it was after another incident in the house. She asked him to leave and he moved back in with his parents. 
basically she was saying the relationship was over then. And But she was trying to keep it nice because they've got a child. She was trying to keep it smooth. They've got a little girl. She wanted the little girl to have a relationship with dad. But dad was dangerous and dad was erratic. And there were a lot of instances where he was breaching intervention orders. There were a number of intervention orders taken out. He did decide to go after the separation to a men's violent management group, to a sort of church-run support group that dealt with violent men. I think one of his employers did him a favour by saying, look, I'm not going to fire you. I'm going to give you two weeks off with paid leave, but you must get counselling. And he did take that up. He did. He went and had counselling. But even that, he wasn't prepared to shoulder on his own. It's interesting. I thought it was interesting that he made Rochelle go with him. So it's sort of sharing the blame, really. You know, he's not fully accepting responsibility that it's his behaviour that needs to change. So he goes to this counselling, but she has to go too. But there's really no point in her going when the problems were his to address, but he couldn't quite get his head around that. And even though he went on those courses, it was a very sort of tepid response. You know, he went along and did what he was supposed to do, but I think he was only going through the motions to get Rochelle back. The fact that he made her go with him says everything to me. He wasn't actually accepting any responsibility for his behaviour at all. Before their counselling session, they've had another incident where he's attacked her again and again self-harmed when police go to arrest him. Does that end their relationship? They've gone back and forth so many times with so much violence. Does this second attack where he ends up back in jail, does that change anything? It does. That sort of spells an end to it. And that's it was after that that she asked him to move out, and he did. So they're sort of still going for counselling. I'm looking back, I think she was going to keep things nice because he needed the help if he were to see his child. So it's not going for counselling with a view to reconciling, not from her point anyway. She's going to counselling because that's the only way he's going to go and get the help he needs. And she needs to be sure that he will be able to look after the little girl or see have a relationship at all with the little girl, which he couldn't have if he's drunken on ice. So they were coming from different places. I think he was hoping for a reconciliation. She never was. So she gets intervention orders in order to help her deal with this situation because he hasn't stopped drinking, he hasn't stopped taking drugs, he is starting to harass her, even though they're not living together, they're no longer a couple. Do those intervention orders work? No. So he continues to be problematic and she's living in a different suburb by then. She's living in the Fountain Gate area of Melbourne and he was sporadically seeing the little girl, but she was very, very nervous about the little girl going there and I think she'd cease contact for a while. So if he wanted to have contact, he would have to improve. And so the next time she saw him in November of 2009, he seemed to be better. She thought he seemed better. Again, he turned up unannounced outside her home in breach of his intervention orders. That was the 28th. That constituted the 28th breach. So he shouldn't have been there, but he turned up and she was... He rang her first, where I am, and she was somewhere else. Oh, can you come home? I really want to see my daughter. And I think she gave it a go a couple of times. He'd seen the little girl a short while before that, and she'd allowed him to have the child overnight, but he was at his parents, and the parents were supervising. And he was so ecstatic about that. He posted photos on Facebook. He posted things on social media, so happy to have his little girl, and his parents were. She had some hope. I think that's the thing with these relationships. You know, they give hope that things might be turning around, but then they didn't. So that was earlier on. And then by November, he'd turned up at her house and he'd been drinking, he'd been taking drugs. He wanted to take the little girl to the milk bar to get a kinder surprise, but that was a ruse. And he later said to the police, he had no intention. He just said that so he could take the little girl. Didn't he also turn up with like a giant knife in his lap? It was on that occasion, so it was in November 2009. He turned up, he'd been drinking, he'd been taking drugs, and he had a giant knife on the dashboard of the car. She actually saw the knife, but he'd already got the little girl in the car on his knee. And I think she was very nervous. It was like, let him just take her to the shops, get a kinder surprise, bring her back, and we'll all be good. But that was very optimistic. He had no intention of taking the little girl just to the milk bar, and off he went. So, and he'd been at that stage on a three-day bender. So when he turned up at Rochelle's house on that day, 
He'd actually been on a three-day drink and drug bender, and he was in no fit state to be doing anything at all. And there'd been an incident a few days earlier where he was off his rocker and he'd been off on this drug bender and he then said he was going to hand himself into the police before he did anything else. And he'd driven to the local police station, but his dad and his brother thought, if we can defuse it and just bring him home and sober him up and stop him doing this, he'll be okay. They were worried though, weren't they? Because he was sort of hinting that maybe he wanted to die by police suicide, by maybe confronting them. Yes, and he was talking about suicide by cop and that's what they were afraid of so they intercepted him at the police station before it got out of hand and then he took off again and was gone for a couple more days so the bender continued you know he was going places like parks and drinking and just not coping so that spiraled as he took the little girl and led police on a high-speed car chase right across Melbourne. In this time though Rochelle understands not long after he's gone that something's not right because the milk bar in question is literally like a minute down the road. So when he doesn't come back, what starts to happen between the two of them? Because they are communicating back and forth during this time where he's taken little Mimi. Talk me through some of the communications between the two of them. Well, she's calling him saying, where are you? Are you coming back? And he's abusive. She was panicking. And then her friend who was with her a friend rang and said, what are you doing? Bring Mimi back right now. You know, she's got to go to bed. They tried to sort of appease him. Are you bringing her back? Can you please bring her back? And he was not making any sense. Then he was saying, no, he wasn't bringing her back. And then he started to torment her. So she started to get these texts, you know, you know, look what you've done to me. You're going to be sorry. Oh, there were menacing texts. And he was also posting things on Facebook that they could see. That to kill my kid. Well, that's, you know, she was terrified. And at one stage he said he had killed her, but he hadn't at that stage. So she thought he was just off his trolley, but she was still very scared about him driving the car with the little girl. And she was sincerely scared. So they contacted the police and that sparked a police chase. So he took off and he went from one side of the city in the eastern suburbs to the northern suburbs with the little girl, you know, the whole time taunting the child's mother. And at one stage, I think he even put, the little girl on the telephone so she could hear her. So she knew she wasn't dead. You know, he'd already said the child was dead, she wasn't dead. But it was a sort of cat and mouse game of torment and torture. It was cruel. And the whole time, you know, he, he just wouldn't come back. And then his, I think they contacted his own family. So his own family were out looking for him. They were scared. His father and brother were out looking for him. So that spiralled. We knew the police were after him. He's already a person in trouble. He's already broken his intervention orders for the 28th time. He's now in breach of the suspended prison sentence again. So he knows he's going to jail. He's definitely going to go to jail. He's sort of sealed his own fate. And he's saying, you know, he can see no way out. You know, he's got nothing to lose, doesn't care. But then it's the sort of anger then turns from Rochelle to the little girl. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to hurt the baby. See what you've made me do. Now see what you've made me do. And he drove Mimi to a remote wasteland area where he stabbed her repeatedly with this very large ornamental knife. It was the sort of thing you hang on the wall. You know, he stabbed her repeatedly. And again, in the same way as Arthur Freeman, is shocked by his own rage. But not that shocked that he didn't post another message saying, you know, she's dead, she's gone, pay back his slut. What's interesting is he's actually got a new girlfriend at this stage. And he meets up with her after murdering his daughter and tells her what he's done, but she doesn't believe him. He was talking like a drug scrambled, drug affected crazy. So she, I guess she wasn't really believing anyone would do that. And why would he go and see her if he'd done that? But then he, he gets her to bring her car and meet him somewhere and they go somewhere. He then torches his car. But she's shocked then. She sees him torch the car and gets into her car because he knows the police are looking for his car, so he torches it. But now he's in the car with her and police are looking for him. So she eventually is arrested with him and they've quickly ruled her out. She hadn't got a clue what was going on. She very quickly ruled her out. But he then, under cross-questioning or intense questioning by the police, admits that he's killed his little girl. And he even takes the police to show them where her body is, which was just awful. And she was horribly murdered. 
And the worst, I think one of the most upsetting things was the coroner's report on that little girl was that she didn't die quickly. It was a horrible death. And she was a little tiny girl. She wasn't even three. So he takes them to show where the child is, but his concern is for himself. One of the first questions he says to the detective is, what's going to happen to me? Which is really interesting. He's not thinking, oh my God, did she suffer? Was she dead when I left her? You know, did he leave her dying? Who knows? But, you know, he didn't give that any real thought. His thought was, what's going to happen to me? Because we know what they do to people like me in jail. It was very self-interested. And that was quite striking about the case, I think. So he's thinking about himself through all of this. Do they ask him at any stage why he did what he did? Did he try and explain why he'd done what he'd done to little Mimi? No, he was a little preoccupied with himself. He did say, though, you know, he was blaming everything on his partner. You know, she didn't want him, that everything was over. It's all poor me. Poor me, you know, he'd been drinking. Uh, he had been drinking and he had been on drugs and he, he was sleeping it off in a cell. He wasn't very forthcoming, but he had admitted to it. He'd taken them to show them where the body was. They'd got their case. They'd got their man and he was in custody. When it got to court, it was that he was distraught about it all, driven to the edge, all this sort of stuff. But he wasn't. You know, everything else shows the opposite. He had many opportunities in that six-hour chase to pull over, to hand the child to his own parents, to go back and take the child back. But he had no intention of doing it. He said he had no intention of doing it. He was going to kill that little girl. I think there's a sense that if I can't have her, you can't have her. In that time frame when he was communicating with Rochelle during this six hours, he was saying to her, this is what it feels like to not have your child in your life. How does it feel now? So it's obvious that he has got real intention with what's happening here. Yes, it's revenge. He's saying... You can feel the hurt that I've been feeling. See how you like it. This is what it feels like for me, not being able to see her whenever I like. But of course, the reason he couldn't see her whenever he liked was because he'd been so violent and dangerous and because he kept breaching his intervention orders. So he wasn't really doing what he needed to do. He did go on these programs, but even the people running the programs said he showed very little insight into his own behavior, that there wasn't a lot of progress in his behavior because he he just had no appreciation for for just how bad he was you're listening to true crime conversations with me claire murphy i'm speaking with journalist and author megan norris about the shocking murder of little mimi akar at the hands of her father in november 2010 So while all of this chaos and violence is happening between Rochelle and Akar, he seems to be gentle and affectionate towards his daughter on pretty much every occasion. So would Rochelle have ever had a fear that he would hurt little Mimi in the ways that he was hurting her? No. And I think that was the reason that she was trying so hard. And a lot of these women do. They'll often say, you know, the violence has never been directed at the children. I know that experts would argue listening to mum and dad fighting and dad being violent to mum is family violence and is violent for the children. But he'd always been very attentive towards the little girl who was only very small. Remember they had separated. So she'd separated from him when Mimi was quite small and was trying really hard to keep things smooth. I also think that in some of the cases, especially this one, it was a very revolving sort of relationship where she called it off he would be sorry, it's a cycle, and apologize, and she'd see the kind of more generous person that she fell in love with. And so, you know, she relented and she'd go back and then she wouldn't. When it finally ended, he was still very loving towards the little girl and he was hurting about not seeing the little girl. And she knew that was hurting his his family who were really decent people. And she was a, a nice girl. She didn't want to stop the family from having a relationship with their little granddaughter. And she didn't want Akar to to not have a relationship with this little girl. She wanted that. She just didn't want the violence. So when he rocks up outside her house after breaking his intervention order for the 28th time and says, please, you know, can I just take her to the milk bar, which was two minutes away? 
can I just take her to the milk bar for a kinder surprise? She had the choice of saying no and risking something really bad happening, you know, firing him up and something really bad would happen. I think her thought was, let him go. It'll be two minutes. He'll be back in two minutes. And then at least he will go home and we'll all be safe. But she had taken so many severe beatings from him and threats to her life. She was more convinced he was going to really hurt her. So I think she was protecting herself. Maybe she thought that knife was for her. He'd never hurt his little girl before. So you can sort of understand where she's coming from, never dreaming he would do anything to harm this tiny little girl. On that basis, she said, okay, be quick. And she got a friend with her. When he didn't come back, they started to panic, but they were straight on the phone saying, could you hurry up? Where are you? Just hurry up and bring her home. Even that was conciliatory. They were trying to smooth his feathers, bring her back. But she had seen that ornamental knife on the dashboard and that had made her very uneasy. But he was theatrical, remember, and whenever he'd done anything with knives, it was to himself. So she still didn't believe he would ever harm his daughter. She just thought that he was dramatic and histrionic, which he was. That's, I think, where people are going to find stories like Rochelle's and Mimi's really difficult to really comprehend because parents would say a man has pulled up, he's obviously been drinking, he's drug affected, he's got a massive knife which he's already self-harmed with and he points this out to her on the night that he comes to see Mimi. There's going to be so many people who say, how could she possibly not have thought that he would do something to their daughter when he's in this state, he has a weapon. But for women who have experienced violence like this and coercive control like Rochelle had, it's really difficult to explain to people who've never been in that situation how she would allow their daughter to go with him. Well, if you think about it, a lot of the things he did to Rochelle were also not just physical, he was physically very violent, but it was emotional abuse. It was coercive control. It was master manipulation. He would apologize and cry and he needed her. She did everything to try and help him. She knew she couldn't be with him anymore. She'd asked him to leave the house some long time before and he'd gone back to his family. She knew she couldn't be with him, but at least if she could keep it smooth and offer him an olive branch by allowing him to see the little girl who he had never hurt or shown any rage towards, And also these women are told, it's your fault. It's your fault. That blaming language runs all the way through that relationship. What did you make me do that for? Now look what you've made me done. He blamed everybody for everything. He never took any responsibility. So the range had always been directed at her. And at some level, I believe, she did think it was all her fault because he told her so. It's your fault. If you hadn't made me so angry, I wouldn't have done that. So if you think about it in that frame of mind, and it's a cycle of, wearing her self-esteem down, also eroding her ability to make sound judgments because these women, they doubt their own judgment all the time. Am I being unfair? Am I being unreasonable? Maybe I'm making it harder for him. Perhaps if I make it easier for him, he won't be so upset and so angry towards me. And that happened in a lot of these cases. And again, that's the worst part of these crimes. Those women, those poor women lived with that huge burden of guilt for the rest of their lives. And in the same way, Akar's threats of suicide were designed to punish Rochelle. So if anything did happen, it would be, look what you made me do to myself. It's your fault that I'm feeling so despairing. And I honestly think she was trying to keep that scene as smooth as she possibly could by saying, okay, two minutes, two minutes, bring her straight back. I don't think she ever believed that he was going to go off on a six-hour police chase and do what he did. She would never have let her little girl go. Well, this is the questions that come up surrounding this case in particular because we're being told more and more now that we need to focus on men and focus on helping men and getting them counselling and giving them places to go to when they aren't dealing with anger issues. But in this case, he'd seen a counsellor. He'd been to a men's anger management course. We're also told all the time that women need to get intervention orders so police can intervene in these situations and act faster than they could had there not been an intervention order in place. But all of these things that we're being told are supposed to help in this situation were in place in this case, and it did nothing. Yes, and you have to ask the question, 
How many times do you allow someone to breach an intervention order before you actually lock them up for breaching an intervention order? 28 times. It was very extreme. Why wasn't he locked up after the second time or the third time or the 20th time? Why does it have to be 28 times? I think when you've got someone who repeatedly flouts intervention orders, it's a massive red flag because basically it's a piece of paper and they couldn't care less. You know, so it's all right, the police charging him. But why didn't the courts follow it up? Why wasn't he locked up for that? Why wasn't he immediately locked up without bail? On time number two, even. You know, he's been given one chance, wrote the order, okay, you don't do it again. But he did again and again, and I just do not understand. Even when the police do act and take intervention orders out on behalf of people like Rochelle, which they did take intervention orders out to protect her, the courts aren't really following it through. The response of the courts to those constant breaches is not effective. And I was talking about this with a DV lawyer the other day. Her name is Kathleen Simpson, and she is a very prominent DV lawyer in Queensland. I think she's Queensland Lawyer of the Year. And she said exactly the same thing. She said, well, how do you see it? And I said, immediate stiff punishments, strict punishments for people who break intervention orders should exactly. That's exactly how she sees it. And then I spoke with a police prosecutor who said, you know, we bring those cases to court and then the courts don't follow it through. So the response needs to be tougher, I think, and it needs to be sooner. Rochelle Darcy was preparing for little Mimi's birthday when all of this was happening. What's incredible about this woman who's been through so much with this man, so much violence, so much pain, so much hurt, and to have the ultimate horrific betrayal at the end, she still has little Mimi's birthday party afterwards in a real show of strength that she wasn't going to allow this man to take everything from her. It was very sad. I can remember that birthday party. And they had balloons. They let all these balloons off and they, they'd they already got presents for her and the cake ordered and so they had the Dora Explorer cake that she wanted so much. She would have been three. And that was about six days after her murder, it must have been incredibly painful for her to do that. I don't know how she had the strength to do that. But also, you, you know, people are still in shock. She would have been in such shock. You sort of function on, a lot of these mums say, it's just a blur when they look back years later, or the whole thing. It all goes into one big blur of pain. And I think Rochelle was in that place, you know, where you're just functioning on fumes. It's all unreal. There's disbelief, there's shock. And I really do think she showed tremendous courage. By the time that case came to court, she was in a different place. She was very angry, very upset. And I think all of that, because, you know, grief's a process. It was a different thing. But even in the court case, his thoughts were not for regret for what he'd done to the surviving mother, to the grandparents on both sides, to the little girl herself. His thoughts were only for himself. And by then he was blaming everyone. He blamed Rochelle for letting her take Mimi in the first place. He blamed Rochelle again because she'd seen the knife and she still let him. So he said it was her fault. He blamed his parents for not making him stop at the police station or not allowing him to hand himself in. So either taking him home and saving him or letting him hand himself in. He blamed the police for not arresting him sooner. And then he blamed the courts for giving him too heavy a sentence, which I thought was rich. You know, so after he was sentenced to prison, he complained that the sentence was too harsh. So he was still hard done by and he was still playing the victim and it was still all about him. I know that hearing that, it's obviously not true because he is responsible for his own actions and he showed time and time again that he had intent and he knew what he was doing. But how much blame do we place on the system amongst all of this? I think the system failed by not locking him up. They should have locked him up much sooner. Then again, that's just a cop-out for him, isn't it? I'll blame everybody else and then I'm not anything to do with it. It's a passive sort of attitude when, in actual fact, he's fully responsible. He planned to do it. He said all along he planned to do it. He wasn't going to take her to the milk bar. He was going to take her away. And he got the knife there anyway. What was he planning to do with that? He was armed. He was drugged. I think he, he is solely responsible, but I do think the system failed to respond to the risk assessment. I think it wasn't good enough risk assessment with him. With the system letting her down in so many ways, I believe it was Rochelle who, after 
Mimi was murdered, didn't Centrelink cut off her childcare payments? They did, and then she had to get out of her house. It was terrible. It was like she she hadn't got a child anymore, so she didn't need this, and she and she couldn't work. She was in a mess. It was terrible. But it, yeah, it was a very sad case. And when he came to court, he'd carved tears down his face with pencils. He'd etched these tattooed tears down the side of his face as a sort of outward show of his sorrow and grief. But he wasn't. He wasn't sorry at all. He never once said sorry. And he actually tried to call her mother from inside prison, which is not allowed. You know, you have to have a nominated list of callers, people you can call and people who can visit. And he managed to get somehow past that system and call her mother, which is strictly forbidden. So he was still tormenting them. He wasn't sorry. He was sorry for himself and sorry that he got caught. You mentioned before the blame and guilt that perpetrators of cohesive control inflict on their partners or former partners. But in the case of Rochelle, you also saw that blame and guilt being contributed to by people online on social media. Women especially, who were the worst judges of other women, were really paying out on Rochelle. What were you thinking of letting him take your child in the first place? So they weren't blaming him, saying what was he thinking about breaking his intervention order for the 28th time what made him think he was entitled to turn up at that house, abduct that poor little girl and then horribly murder her in the most awful, grotesque way? He was off the radar. It was all about, what did you do that for? And they were blaming her. So not only did she have him say, look what you made me do, she had other people saying, look what you made him do. And I think that's absolutely the tragedy of these cases. You know, if that little girl had been killed by a drunk driver... I think it would have been less blame to the perpetrator than that poor innocent mother had to endure. The onus of the responsibility for that crime was placed squarely on her for letting Mimi go. But people should have been blaming the perpetrator. They were not seeing. What they were doing was victimising the victim. And I really hate that. And you see that quite a lot in these cases. Cindy Gambino once told me, and she had her three little boys murdered when her ex-husband drove them into a dam on Father's Day and swam away, leaving them to drown. She told me once she went shopping for the first time with her new baby and someone basically said, what did you do to him to make him so angry? And she was absolutely devastated and she scurried back home and didn't want to come out again. She felt she couldn't even enjoy her new baby and she already wasn't able to bond with that baby because of the grief she felt. And here is someone saying, well, surely you must have seen it coming. And at that stage, she still believed he was innocent. She believed that was a terrible accident. But to have a woman saying to her, well, how stupid are you then? You must be really stupid for believing that. Of course he's guilty. And how didn't you see it? Now, that denial was something she'd constructed to survive. Because once that denial started to crumble and she saw what he'd really done, she went to pieces and fell in a heap. I believe that that's what's happened with Rochelle. But both of those women were separately blamed for not seeing it coming when the blame should have been squarely on the offenders. And both of those offenders and Arthur Freeman, out of all the cases I did, only those three went to court. A lot of the others took their own lives. But these three didn't. Robert Farquharson dragged Cindy in and out of court to watch her suffering as she relived the horror over and over again. Arthur Freeman played the madman, and his wife had to come to court and deal with that. And Ramazan Eckhart blamed her. He actually blamed his own parents. He blamed the police for not arresting him sooner. He blamed his parents for not letting him commit suicide by cop, which is something he had in his mind. And he blamed the mother. And then he blamed the system for giving him too harsh a penalty for the crime he'd committed and shown no remorse for. Thanks to Megan for her assistance in telling this story. If you'd like to know more about this case, you can find more details in Megan's book, Look What You Made Me Do, which is linked in our show notes. Megan will be back next week for the final episode of our series on retaliatory filicide. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Claire Murphy. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan, with assistant production by Tali Blackman. Our audio design is by Scott Stronick. 
Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.